future and beyond. And what may be beyond future? I could. I want to ask you three questions. First, uh, <laughs> did you ever try to watch black and white movies with your with kids who are under 10 years old? Do they have problems watching uh, black and white movies or movies of the 50s, of the 40s? Not because they don't understand. They merely cannot perceive what is being shown because they are not accustomed to watching black and... Uh, they are not accustomed to watching black and white movies. The second question that I want to ask, uh, do you have problems, do, do you have sensory problems watching three-dimensional movies, 3D movies. We are not accustomed to watching three-dimensional movies, but the younger generation doesn't have any problems watching 3D movies, right? So it's a kind of a difference, a cognitive difference between us, us I mean us people who are uh, 20 years old and older, I don't mean just people who are 50 and over, <laughs> I mean people who are 20 plus, and the younger generation, which is coming to classrooms, which constitutes uh, the majority of the audiences of internet video on demand channels and so on and so on. We teach people to translate for them. We translate cartoons for them. And we need to know how different they are in the cognitive sense of the word. What is different in their perception? Without knowing that, we cannot customize the process to make it to go to the future and beyond. And what does this future bring? Virtual reality, which is more in terms of senses, in terms of the sensory input. It is much more than three-dimensional. It's just reality, it's just changed reality. People uh, pay more attention to what is going around. There is more pressure on their senses, right? And uh, as you might have noticed, uh, the more complicated technological advances are, three-dimensional movies are very simple in terms of plots. People are not made to think about plots. It's plots, uh, I mean stories that are told, are getting simpler and simpler. The more advanced the technology is, the simpler the process is made for the audiences. There is more, much more input for the audience. And we de devised a kind of a perception of uh, the course, whom and how we teach audiovisual translation and how we do the dubbing processes. Should I switch into Russian? Do you follow me? Vorrete una traduzione come prima o qualsiasi può continuare a parlare in inglese? So, we have to assume, the first thing that we have to assume is that the younger audiences are cognitively different and we should we perceive the process of audiovisual translation as a cognitive activity. A translator actually has to model the audience the way it it will perceive the translation because the original project combines the mix of uh, words, images, and beyond images like 3D images. And when we translate, we may occasionally spill over. We may add too much. People will be involved with the visuals and pay no attention to the words. So because uh, the translation will be redundant, it will be too much to understand. They won't follow the plot or they won't drop, they won't perceive some of the jokes, etc., etc. So we have to understand it as a cognitive process and we start with cognitive studies. We teach our students uh, how the audiovisual productions are being perceived, games, uh, films, etc., etc. Then uh, we noticed that most of the uh, classical, the so-called classical translators have problems understanding that an audiovisual production is a whole. It is a whole, it is an, a, a unity uh, of uh, visuals, images, etc., etc. There are, there is research done by Anna Pilar Orero who uh, actually substantiated the claim that the visuals are dominant in the perception of uh, the audiovisual translations and it's uh, well actually it's a revelation for most classical translators that you have to first analyze the visuals and 
more, what is more important to analyze the plot because the plot is actually where the characters are and uh, dubbing and uh, well subtitling to a lesser degree but dubbing is more about characters you have to build a character but character is an element that is plot based so we have to teach our students script writing plot analysis because without that they won't understand for example this this is a protagonist and this is an antagonist. This is a good guy and a bad guy. And in Russian, uh, and also we have to attract people's attention to the fact that in Russian we do the so-called dynamically equivalent or emotionally equivalent translation. Because uh, uh, we have, in the 90s, we had problem with translation of comedies. Well, they were translated. There were hundreds of them, them that were translated. But they were no fun. They were not funny. Jokes were lost in translation massively because they were correctly translated. Absolutely. Everything word to word. But no one laughed. So uh, as, we, as we move on, uh, more comedies in terms of sensory input require direct emotional responses like uh, hilarious comedies and the Russian school of dubbing developed and evolved in a way that actually attracts more attention to the emotional equivalent. And in terms of games, behavioral experience, because people are supposed, well, when you are an Italian and you are playing a game, a computer game, audiovisual game, which was uh, uh, programmed in Italy, you expect a certain set of actions from the players. If it's incorrectly translated, what happens? The person has another gaming experience, it gets lost in the game. And uh, this is what the whole thing is about. So uh, we change, uh, we change uh, the whole approach because what some people say, do you teach for audiovisual translation from the scratch? We don't. We know that people who come to our classrooms uh, are actors, are translators who already have some experience with English, French, German, etc., etc. What we need to do actually to change the operational system. On their heads. It's like switching from Windows to Mac. It's pretty much the same, but it is very different. You rewire. Rewire the mentality. You change the framework. You make people think different. And there is a breaking point. Our system of exercises is supposed to bring them to the point. Well, it's most, uh, it looks like a religious revelation. Like, oh, I see the world differently. Now I watch movies differently, now I translate them differently. It is not word for word translation, it's scene for scene translation, emotion for emotion translation, action for action translation, I mean in terms of games. And then it becomes for the, much easier for them to build uh, their approach to new technological advances because they know how not to spill over, how not to give to the viewers too much, how not to distract them from the flow and information that comes to their senses. And we always, the last thing I'm going to conclude my presentation with is that we always uh, try to give our translators their place in the so-called collective authorship or the workflow. We try to make them understand how they interact with actors, diving directors. We always try to teach them how to subtitle, what it means, why all these restrictions for subtitling exist. It is not just 42 letters and two lines and that's it, folks, just stick to it and I won't explain why it is so. Because it's perception based. People have to understand it, people have to integrate it, and people have to build a coherent image of what they see on the screen and not just listen to what you translate without paying any attention to what is going on the screen. Uh, and the last thing that is very practical and what is, brings us in common with most uh, courses of audiovisual translation in the world is that we teach people constrained translation. But this is the last thing, not the first thing we start with. Constraints of visuals, constraints of timing, constraints of space. But before we start teaching people just the constraints, we explain where they come from. Thank you for your attention and if you wish, you, we could, I could show to you what uh, we'll, we, we, Diomid had about three minutes left, and I could show to you what Russian dubbing really 
looks like. Okay? своего места в этой вселенной, того, кто я есть и кем мне всегда суждено быть. Я Стар Скрим, вечный заместитель и покорный слуга лорда Мегатрона. Благодарю за внимание, Саундвейв. За то время, что я провел в темнице, я придумал план. Ты меня подставил. Ну да, подставил, разумеется. Думаешь, мы шли добывать золото и восстанавливать твое честное имя? Это предприятие преследовало одну цель. Сеня, ты так хотел вернуть старый долг? Что ж, я тоже. Зачем ты это сделал? А кто меня на мосту бросил? Кто сбежал, когда ты был мне так нужен? Куда подевались, братья навеки? Я тебе верил, друг. Теперь ты понял, что чувствовал тогда я? Я тоже верил и получил удар в спину. Стража! Здорово, народ! О, привет, Норман. Все еще ищешь свою квартиру? А, пошла уже четвертая неделя. А это третий этаж или второй? О, я в цифрах не разбираюсь, но ты здесь не живешь. А, так не пруха. Ну ладно, еще увидимся. Идем с подать Макса! А Макс это вообще кто? Тебе? Нет, плохая, плохая птица! Какой яженький! Какой хорошенький! Какая птичка! Правда, не могу чокнуть, мне кажется! So, this is what it means when we say, and this was a very good translation that an actor really can live through. Because uh, when we don't, the collective authorship idea that we teach our translators means that they all think towards, they have the common ground in terms of uh, emotions and uh, experiences that they want people to live through. So thank you for your attention.